and, uh, more data and analytics talent over the next year and insert the role of chief data officer into their executive team if they haven't already. 48%, 84% of management teams have access to their organization's data and analytics, but only 48% of the frontline employees have access to that data. 85%, 85% of those surveyed said that their firms were committed to creating a data-driven culture, but only 48% have access to the data, so how, how is that possible? Yet 37% said they were successful with that effort. So even with the aspiration of becoming a data-driven company, you can see the numbers don't necessarily reflect uh, the path to success for many uh, of these companies. So let's fast forward. Let's talk about the U.S. a little bit. Um, FDA, one of the senior officials at the FDA, Dr. Janet Woodcock, uh, came on record last fall and she stated that the clinical trial system is broken. She went on to say that the way that we think about uh, clinical trials needs to be modernized, um, certainly needs to be digitized, but the way that we're really approaching it is unsustainable, not just from a regulatory perspective, but just even from a normal state of business. As you can see, with the cost of drug development having risen, and I think that uh, uh, the individuals highlighted that in the opening panel, you can see that the cost of drugs development is certainly unsustainable, going from roughly $200 million in the 70s to well over $2, uh, $2 billion as we currently stand today. When you think about clinical trials, you're thinking about an average of roughly seven years, and I'm talking about just the, the various phases within the, the drug development process, just the clinical trial phases. An average of seven years and $1.6 billion specifically in order to conduct. So you can, you can imagine that most big pharma companies are thinking to themselves, there's no way we can continue to sustain this in the current way that we have, especially considering that many of the drugs that are actually being submitted are not necessarily being approved. What else is factoring into this push towards big data? Well, I think we, we obviously are talking about, you hear things around personalized medicine, but the thing that often goes understated is the shift towards the value-based value -based healthcare system, which in many respects is moving from the clinical benefit, which was what we focused on in the past, to now clinical outcomes, and the clinical outcomes achieved, which is what we all aspire to do. And at the center of that, uh, you can see that we have an emphasis on value, increased patient accountability, advanced data and analytics, and of course, increased collaboration across all the various sectors. So let's talk about the who. Personally, I think that the future is enabled through real world data and analytics. It's certainly not just because that's the group that I lead, but it's more importantly because uh, this is, it is actually true. Um, the, the way that we go about thinking about data and thinking about patients in a very homogeneous fashion is certainly not reflective of the real world. And so what we want to do is to create a world where we can actually identify subpopulations, we can recognize the heterogeneity that exists in the patients, and we can then tailor interventions that are specific to those particular patient groups. So this is where we are. So Deloitte uh, Consulting actually releases a annual benchmarking report on real world evidence. And in it, they highlight the past use of RWE and also the future use of RWE. So what we are right now is that the top, well if you look at the past uses of real world evidence or big data, um, then you really are talking about mostly a better understanding of subpopulations and heterogeneity of treatment effects. You're talking about the understanding of the burden of disease, and you're also talking about uh, pharmacovigilance activities. But the future of real world evidence lies mostly in optimizing the design of clinical trials and also su supporting regulatory submissions and or label expansion. And of course, we also want to better understand subpopulations. So you can see that generally there's a shift from just focusing on the burden of disease and certain subpopulations to the optimization of clinical trials. Um, this particular quote was taken from uh, good friends over at Atheon, an analytics uh, platform company uh, based in uh, uh, well, they're based in New York, but they have a couple of Harvard professors that started it. Um, I just love the way that they frame their thinking around the use of big data. They said, uh, having transparent, shared, and scientifically validated evidence of therapies that work for patients in a real world setting will better enable patients, providers, payers, and regulators to make more informed decisions about the most medically appropriate and cost efficient treatment 
for patience. So this is the way I think the world should work, right? Um, so in addition, of course, we want the patient in the center, but there needs to be, well, and there, and there, there tends to be uh, this conflation uh, or convergence of sectors that are happening in healthcare. We're seeing now providers becoming payers, payers becoming providers, payers becoming PBMs. Uh, we're seeing digital companies become biopharma companies, uh, biopharma companies becoming digital companies, so on and so forth. So what does the world really look like um, when you think about this interconnectedness of all the different sectors? And how do you develop an RWD, or real world data, or big data, an analytic strategy that meets the needs of all the stakeholders across the product life cycle? This is my uh, proposed, uh, I think it's five step plan for how you best do that. All right, so first thing you need to do is understand the fundamental challenges that could impede progress. Um, as part of that, there are five, five key elements of understanding what those fundamental challenges are. First thing is, is that you need to understand that data democratization matters. Data sharing matters. We need more data sharing. Obviously, we need higher quality data. There is so, there's voluminous amounts of data being generated across disparate systems in every sector. And then, of course, we're, there's uh, increasingly this discussion around social determinants of health and how we best partner with non-traditional um, uh, healthcare companies or, or data sources in order to better understand the experience of patients. Second thing is, is data security matters. Um, there, it, was, it was reported uh, earlier this year that the most targeted uh, companies for uh, security breaches were healthcare providers or integrated delivery networks in the US. Uh, one CIO I know from New York Presbyterian mentioned to me that she gets one, one million hack attempts a day. One million. So if you think that data security doesn't matter, then I think that uh, you'll be in for a rude awakening. The, sec the, the third thing is around overhyping. Um, I, I had the pre pleasure of sitting next to Eric, who uh, works for uh, Orca, Okra, Okra, Okra yeah. AI company. And uh, I'm not picking on him, but, I, but, I, but generally when I think about these companies, I think about their ability to overhype their own capabilities by saying they can do things that they really can. Um, that's some of the uh, common stuff. Another thing that we have to be concerned about is the lack of talent that exists in the digital and data space. In many cases, you have to uh, grow that organically. Then you need to keep, keep the sustained key leadership. The one thing that we're doing at Pfizer is we recognize that talent doesn't necessarily grow on trees, and we need people that fully understand the business of pharma, while at the same time introducing a fresh perspective. So, uh, so we're, we're, we're making uh, conscious attempts to address that through organic uh, growth and leadership. The lesson number two, know where you are on the maturity continuum. This is actually a, uh, uh, the maturity continuum as articulated by Gardner, and it talks about knowing where you are as you seek to become a much more digitally or data-driven organization. You start off at level one at the basics, you meet those requirements, and then wherever you aspire to be, whether that's level two through five, then those are the requirements in order to be there. Lesson number three, um, which is what I know very well. You cannot boil the ocean, so you need to identify specific use cases as to where you will effectively use big data across the product life cycle. Um, you have early clinical development, and of course, where you've got characteriz characterization of unmet need and novel tar target discovery. You've got clinical development, where you have clinical trial design and optimization, which we discussed earlier. And of course, you have commercialization or, or other areas that you can focus on. Level, uh, lesson four, choose the right operating model. Uh, personally, uh, the model that we chose to do was a hybrid of centralization and COE. Um, so in one hand, we wanted to centralize many of the functional activities that were uh, redundant across uh, many of the, the divisions within Pfizer. You can imagine that being more like your data management, data acquisition uh, type of uh, functions. But when it comes to data analytics, that is something I don't believe that should be centralized at all. And I think the open panel discussed that, the idea of institutionalizing analytical capabilities across the organization. Uh, lesson five, pay proper attention to data governance. And really, what this really means is pay proper attention to data ethics, or the ethical use of data as we begin to incorporate more expanded use of disparate data types more so than we ever have done before. Lesson six, 
and I think one of the open panelists mentioned this, around the idea of creating that back end, that robust, centralized data infrastructure that allows for interoperability, that allows for high quality data, and that allows for one single, a single source of truth. Lesson seven, break down, uh, I didn't realize I had seven lessons, I thought there were five, so I didn't need more than I thought. Uh, <laughs> uh, lesson seven, break down the data silos and unleash data and insights as a service. And it's really around creating a self-service capability, more so, and also a data catalog. And uh, the closing thoughts that I have are, if you have governance, management, uh, that's data management, that is, a data architecture, high data quality, security and privacy, it'll equal real world data and analytics success. And as I close, I want to leave you with these parting words. In the future, it will not be the big fish that eat the small fish. It will be the, it will be the fast fish that eat the slow fish. Thank you very much.